Hello, everyone. I welcome you to today's SciOmics session. SciOmics is a bioinformatics and a data science student club. It is an initiative taken by the students associated with Pine Biotech. The goal of the SciOmics club is to help students learn about bioinformatics research via group sessions, easy to take courses, debates, and discussions. Bioinformatics and its related domains are vast and offer a great opportunity for students of life science to forge their own paths. This club welcomes students from all fields of life science to come and meet together and learn from each other. The SciOmics aims at encouraging young minds to push their critical thinking limits beyond the school and college curriculum. We are excited to start the second SciOmics Fall 2022 session today. The theme of the session revolves around multi-omics data analysis and bioinformatics. SciOmics sessions are aimed at bringing together the network of expert educators and students from all around the globe to learn from each other by interacting and discussing the advances in the field of bioinformatics. Discussions will be highlighting the challenges involved in the research using computational tools for big data analysis and opportunities in this outgoing field, along with its applications. Let me introduce myself to all of you. My name is Ayushi Notra, and I am the Marketing Associate and Coordinator at Pine Biotech and the President of the Sciomics Club. I have completed my master's in systems biology and bioinformatics, and I have a keen interest in applying bioinformatics and systems biology approaches used to analyze high throughput data. Here, we have provided you with the links of our Telegram and our WhatsApp groups, along with the QR codes. By joining this student club, you will be able to broaden your horizon and get an opportunity to explore collaborative project internship career and also learn through virtual sessions. You all must be curious to know certain things during the initial stage of your career. Like, how can you get noticed in the community? What are the challenges and opportunities? And where is bioinformatics headed at? The answer to all the above queries is to learn about critical skills needed in academia and industry positions by seeing what others are doing and hearing from leaders and participating in project-driven education that has demonstrable outcomes in learning and placement. The main focus of SciOmics Club is to study about bioinformatics and data science related fields such as infectious disease, microbes and microbiome, plant science, neuroscience, precision oncology, and applications of big data in biology to clear the concepts of bioinformatics, to gain insights on how to use tools of bioinformatics, to learn how to apply research in day-to-day -day life through brainstorming sessions, and to help the group to enhance their critical thinking capabilities and gaining experience in data science skills. To start your bioinformatics journey, you can come on and learn through the Omics Logic Learn portal. The, let me quickly show you what the Omics Logic Learn portal looks like. So this is the Omics Logic Learn portal. If you've already signed in, you can quickly go on to the courses tab or the programs tab to see what the Omics Logic portal beholds for you. And if you are a new user, you can just simply type omicslogic.com on Google and go on to this page and log in or maybe sign in. You can do so by using any of your social media accounts, such as your Google, Facebook, Apple ID, Orchid, or Twitter. Or maybe you can simply log in sign in using your email ID and password that you set by going on to this create an account option. Once you sign in, it's very important to, for you to have an updated profile. For that, you simply need to click on your name and you need to go on to this profile section. Over here, you need to put in your 
profile photo, a brief bio, and link your social media accounts and update your profile. So coming back to the session today, um, the Omics Logic platform also includes certain free introductory courses for you, such as Introduction to Bioinformatics and Bytes and Molecules. These are self-learning introductory courseworks which are related to bioinformatics, omics studies like genomics, transcriptomics, metagenomics, epigenomics, and spaceomics, and data science that includes bioinformatics using R and Python. So the aim of this Sciomics group is to guide students on common queries that you have while you kickstart your career, such as, um, you know, and we do so by group discussions, such as we review report writing based on self-assessed courses, we debate on brainstorming areas in bioinformatics and data science, we perform presentations and research papers, we discuss and exchange ideas for research project development, we discuss about how bioinformatic industries is different from academia, and how can students transit from academia to industry. Along with this, we also discuss about job and internship opportunities for undergraduate and postgraduate students, how to build soft skill and technical skills, and, and the interview and CV guidance. So what will we learn today? We all have heard about NGS, but have you ever wondered what is the revolution and evolution of this technique? And why has this technique become such, as, such an integral part of the Bio, biological sciences. The growing part and reduced cost sparked an enormous range of applications of NGS. Thereby, to understand about the revolution and evolution of this technique, today we have Dr. Vipin Singh with us. He will be talking about the evolution and revolution, a perspective on 40 years of, on DNA sequencing, Dr. Vipin Singh is a postdoctoral fellow at IBENS Paris. He completed his PhD from CSIR, CCMB Hyderabad. He has 10 years of teaching experience and research experience in some of the best private universities in India. He has a specialization in genome transposome bioinformatics and is proficient in various languages such as Perl, Python, R, and Linux. Besides teaching and research, he had a very successful stint at Placement Coordinator and the Corporate Resource Center, and as Admission Coordinator at the Admission Cell. He has been instrumental in grooming students through soft skill training sessions and placement, and placing students in various biotech and allied companies. So thank you so much, Dr. Vipin Singh, for joining with us today. We hope that this session will be full of learnings for all the participants that are here. Once again, I would like to thank you for joining in. Now I'm passing on the stage to you, sir. Uh, thanks, Ayushi. I hope I'm uh, audible to you and uh, we can start with the presentation now. Yes, sir, you're uh, audible. Let me just share my screen and then we can start, right? So share yes. and there you are. So let me just open my PPT here. Uh, there. So there you are. This should be. So you always have this problem of opening multiple PPTs, and then you're not sure which one is the correct one. So let me just take the other one. This is not the one. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. This one, this one, right. So let me just start from the front. All right. So let's get started. And I see there are some 20 students around. So we will. Now start with the talk, and uh, the talk is titled Evolution to Revolution, a perspective on 40 years of DNA sequencing. So we are into the 40th or 41st year of DNA sequencing technologies. It started way back in 1997 and then uh, 1977. And then since then, there has been a continuous evolution of the sequencing techniques. Nowadays, you have four common sequencing techniques. One is Illumina, the other is Ion Torrent. And then you also have what is now coming up in a big way is Nanopore and path biosequencing. So we'll talk each of these as we begin. So we start with the historical perspective, and then we move on to what are these techniques and how these are being applied and how sequencing has become the new microscope. So it is commonly said that sequencing is the new microscope for everything that you need to go forward. First step is to do the sequencing, right? So we'll start with the talk now and we'll see how uh, sequencing has evolved and how it is helping us do better science and do a more comprehensive science 
than we had done earlier, right? So here you are. So we'll look at the basic concept in sequencing and in the historical context. Then we'll look for why there was a need for next generation sequencing techniques in 2001 will be our break point year. Then we'll talk of the contemporary sequencing techniques. We'll talk of short read and long read sequences. We'll talk of virtual terminator sequencing. We'll talk of ion torrent nanopore sequencing, and we'll also talk of real time single molecule real time sequencing. Then we'll talk of applications and data analysis steps in NGS. And remember, a next generation sequencing talk can be endless. You know, there is so much to tell that it, it can be endless. And it is a field that is very quickly evolving. So every time I give this talk, there is a new technique that is available that has to be incorporated and a previous technique that has become obsolete. So that has to be taken off here. So this is uh, how we go about. And uh, then, of course, uh, there are certain prerequisites to NGS data analysis. So the students are expected to know uh, a bit of Linux environment, a bit of programming. So we'll discuss that as well, because I'm sure most of you would go into research. And if you go into research, uh, sequencing is something that you cannot avoid, right? It's like your PCR and wet lab. Sequencing data analysis is now the next thing, and uh, you definitely would come across at some step of your research, you'll, you would have some sequencing data to analyze. So therefore, uh, some of the prerequisites that are important, we'll discuss those as well. So let's uh, look into history. This is February 2001, and if you see here, uh, this is President Bill Clinton, then the President of Americas. And uh, he uh, is basically inaugurating the event that is the launch or the basically the announcement of the completion of the Human Genome Sequencing Project. Uh, and you can see in the background, it says decoding the Book of Life, a milestone for humanity. And the people responsible for this are uh, these two people. This one in front is Craig Winter, who formed Cellular Genomics and, and uh, published a paper in Science with, with, the own, with the Human Genome Sequence. And this one here is Francis Collins. He was the leader of the Human Genome Project, the publicly funded project. And uh, this again, the paper came in Nature. So the two most uh, significant uh, journals in, in, in science uh, as such, right? So I'm sure you would have heard the name. So let's get back to the basics now. So what actually is meant by sequencing, right? So sequencing means that you are looking at the order of nucleotides in a given uh, nucleic acid molecule right so let me just shift this bar here that is uh, all right this one is fine i need to shift this bar. yeah okay so here you are so to determine so what is sequence sequencing is basically to uh determine the let me just close this a bit here so determine the order of nucleotides in a nucleic acid uh, you know there are four nucleotides a t g and c and basically the order in which they appear results in a certain sort of code that can allow for uh, for coding a protein, for encoding a site where a protein can come and bind, for transcription factor binding and so on and so forth, for chromatin modification. So therefore, sequencing becomes important, right? So the question is then, uh, why do you, and um, what the, specifically the sequencing that we're looking at is what is known as the genome sequencing. What is a genome? I'm sure you would know. The genome is one full complement of genetic material in an organism or a cell. And sequencing genomes is challenging even today, and it was much more challenging when we started sequencing the human genome. And we'll come to it why it is so challenging. We'll come to it in the next few slides. So here you are. What is the, the idea of sequencing a genome? Why do you want to sequence genomes? Well, the first thing is you know that DNA is a blueprint. All of you know about the central dogma. So DNA is our genetic code, and then it gets transcribed into RNA, which then gets transcribed into, uh, translated into protein. Protein is the workforce. So therefore, we want to know what is there at the basal level in genetic code. Then we also want to look at how, what are the different types of variations that can exist within these species or between two species. And more importantly, the idea of sequencing the human genome was to basically try and identify variations or the changes in the sequence of between two individuals that can result in disease. So we wanted to, uh, we wanted to associate a, a certain mutation to a certain disease or certain variation to a certain disease. So therefore, uh, the major uh, um, the major objective of sequencing the human genome was for biomedical applications. And I'll give you towards the end of the talk, I'll give an example of how that can be effective, right? So I told you genome sequencing is complex. Why is it complex? Because you know most of the sequencing technologies today rely on synthesizing a complementary DNA strand using DNA polymerase. And then you basically, you know, as the nucleotides get added, you do a real-time identification of which nucleotide got added, and that allows you to basically know what is the order of nucleotides on the template strand. 
So here you are. Uh, the problem is that we still do not have an enzyme that can directly sequence a large piece of DNA. While there has been progress, and we'll talk of it as we move along, but we still do not have, let's say you're trying to sequence chromosome one. So there is no enzyme even today which can in vitro directly replicate chromosome one from one end to the other end. So therefore, if you want to sequence this large DNA molecule, you first have to break it into smaller pieces, right? Which are amenable to sequencing, as in when you do a complementary, uh, you know, enzyme, uh, when you do a complementary extension, uh, you should be able to reach the end of that fragment. So here you are, you break it into smaller fragments, A, B, C, D, and E, and you get the sequence of individual parts. And now the challenge is to rearrange it back in the order it is appearing in the original genome. So that is the process that is known as assembly. So if you look at a typical uh, genome assembly, a genome sequencing project, there are three main parts. One is to create a genomic library, that is to split your genomic DNA into smaller pieces. Second is to sequence these individual pieces. And then the third is to assemble them back into the original order in which they were in the genome, which is called the assembly. And this is where the major problem is. And, you know, uh, it takes time and it, it is most resource intensive. And also it is, this is the place where you can go wrong, right? So therefore, uh, genome sequencing even today is complex. Although now it has become a, a, a lot easier because we are now in the era of long range sequencers. And towards the end of the talk, I'll show you that it is only now in 2022, April 24, we have the first complete assembly of a human genome from telomere to telomere, from one end of the chromosome to the other end of the chromosome without any gaps. I'm sure you would have read that paper. It has come in April 2022, right? So here you are. So now once you have the sequence, you get it back and arrange it in the order. The, it would appear in the genome and finally get your genome sequence. We are following everyone. Yes, sir. We're following. Okay, good. Yes, sir. So then we move on and we talk more about it, right? So here you are. Uh, this got stuck. All right. So let's talk of some basic concepts in sequencing first before we move on to sequencing technologies. So here you are. One of the concepts in sequencing is what is known as read length. So here is an image that I clicked while I was in Paris. I'm also a photographer by hobby. So this is your Eiffel Tower taken from Châtelet in Paris. A beautiful evening. So what does the challenge that I'm giving you is that I'm splitting this picture into four parts, nine parts, and 56 parts. And then you have to rearrange it together back into the original picture. So which of these would be the most difficult to rearrange? Anyone? The last one. The last one. Okay. So it is very clear because it has a lot more parts and therefore there can always be a confusion between, you know, this one and this one. These are roughly the same shade. So I could put this one here and this one here. And then it changes the composition of my picture and I do not get the exact replica of what I originally began with, right? So in, in analogy, you can say that this is a long read sequencer where the, the, the genome that you want to sequence has been broken into larger pieces. This is an intermediate read sequencer. For example, the Sanger sequencer, 900 base pairs. Uh, this one is, let's say, nanopore or uh, pack bio sequencer. And this one is Illumina sequencer, where you have fragments as small as 150 bases to begin with, right? So this is uh, the concept of read length. The longer the read length, the more easy it is to assemble the genome correctly. The shorter the read length, the more the problems, right? So this is your genomic library. This is a large fragment library. This is intermediate read library. This is your short read library, right? So read length, the maximum sequence length that can be obtained in one sequencing reaction. This is specific to each sequencing technique. So if you're using Illumina, you get around 150 bases. If you're using ion torrent, you get around 100 bases. If you're using uh, nanopore, you can on an average get 10 KB sequence. And uh, if you're using PAC bio again or SMRT, single molecule real time sequencing, we'll talk of these as we go into details. Uh, again, you can get very easily 10 KB to 30 KB sequences very easily. So therefore, uh, the assembly becomes a lot easier. So read length is critical is a critical parameter for completeness and accuracy of the genome sequence, more so in repeated genomes. And why this is important is because if you're sequencing the human genome, then the human genome has more than 50% repeat content. So if you rely only on unique overlaps, you will not be able to assemble the genome together. And we'll talk of this in more details as we go along. So here you are. So what you do is you basically have your uh, sequences. These are your short read sequences. You put them together, align it to a reference, for example, let's say. So this is your chromosome 5. And uh, we are looking at positions on chromosome 5, position 500. 
and we're looking also at position chromosome 5, position 5000. So what you've done is this is your reference genome to which you're aligning your short reads, right? So there is a concept of what is known as depth or coverage in sequencing. So what is exactly the depth of coverage in sequencing? If we're looking at an individual position here, let's say we're looking at chromosome 5, position 500, then the number of reads that overlap this position here. So the, each one is 150 basis, but this position, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight reads that map to this position. So the coverage for this position is 8x. Likewise, for this position, chromosome 5, position 5,000, the coverage is 2x. And then you see there is a position here where there are no reads mapping. So this would be a gap. You will not be able to uh, have any coverage here, right? So this is uh, one good idea. One idea of uh, one basic concept in sequencing is of coverage. With next generation sequencing, you get really high coverage. With Sanger sequencing, the maximum you could get was 30x. Mostly you got was 10x. With next generation sequencing, where you can do massively parallel sequencing, you get very easily a coverage of 100x. You can go on to as much x as you want, depending on how much money you have in your project, right? So, and the other idea also is what you do is now that you have your reads aligned up here, you can see this is overlapping with this, then this one is overlapping with this, overlaps with this, overlaps with this. So you can connect all reads that overlap with each other and form what is known as a conti till the point you get your overlap. So here you are. This is what you're doing. Ah, sorry. So this is what is your conti. From here until here, you have overlapping reads. You put them together. You already have a reference, so you're not so mindful of their beats. You put them together into one conti. This region where there is no read map, you cannot extend it any further. Now you come to the second cluster of uh, reads. These are again overlapping with each other. You can put them together as a second conti. So this is your conti too, right? And in between, you have what is known as a gap. And this gap is because there is no read in your uh, library that maps to this region. Now also, how do you increase the coverage? So coverage, if you look at the basic formula is small n into small l. Small l is the length of the individual read that you get, individual sequence that you get. This is fixed as per the platform. I told you, Illumina will give you 150, Iron Torrent will give you 100, and uh, Nanopore and PacBio will give you around, uh, let's say 10 KB to 30 KB. Capital L is the length of your genome, which is also fixed depending on which organism you're looking at. So the only thing you can change here is the N. The more rich your library is, the more repetitive your library is, the higher the coverage you will get, right? So that is important again. Coverage is critical in variation and epigenetic analysis. Higher the coverage, the more statistical power and confidence in the analysis. So basically the idea is that the more coverage you have this position, you are more confident that the nucleotide that you've called here is actually the correct nucleotide, right? So this is one idea of coverage. Then when you assemble genomes, there is also an idea of what is known as N50, right? What is N50? So let's say you have these quantities of varying sizes in your, uh, once you uh, assemble your genome, you have these, uh, so you have a 100 kilobase uh, quantity, the largest one, the 70, 60, 50, 50, 40, and 30. So you arrange your quantities in decreasing order of their uh, length. And then what you're looking for is, you know the length of your, assembly here, the cumulative length of your assembly is 400 kilobases. So now what you're doing is you're looking at the read length that gives you roughly, that gives you 50% of your read length. So 50% of your assembly length. So if your assembly is 400 kilobases, you are looking for, you keep adding the length of contigues here till the time you read, you reach a sum that is equivalent to 200 KB or more, right? So, and then the quantity that corresponds to that basically is your N50. So in this case, 100 plus 70, 170, 170 plus 60, 230. So 60 KB is your N50 value, right? So this is also an indicator of how good your assembly is. The larger the value of the N50, which means the larger the size of the quantity at N50, the more uh, correct your assembly is likely to be, the lesser the gaps are going to be, right? So that is again, uh, one of the concepts in sequencing. You're following class, everyone. Class, you're following? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. That is good. Okay. So then we move on and we talk more about uh, the next concepts. So this is your N50. N50 equals to 60 here. Then we move on and we talk of, uh, so what you can also do is you could basically, once you have your library, you could have larger fragments that you could sequence only from one end or you could sequence from both ends. So this one here, what I show you, 
is a library that is sequenced only at one end. So let's say you're using Illumina. So this could be your 400 basis, but what you're sequencing is only 150 basis from one end, right? And then you align it to a reference genome. So you, your read here gets aligned uniquely at some places. And one of these orange reads get aligned at two different places. So now you know that your orange read is likely to be a repeat, two or more, you know. So if it is a repeat, let's say it is coming from an ALU repeat. So ALU repeats are 1.5 million copies in the human genome. So this sequence, which is coming from an ALU repeat, will go to 1.5 million places in your alignment, right? So this is uh, one idea. Then, so, and what is uh, the basic thing that I'm telling you is that you have your fragment, but you have only sequenced it from one end. The other thing that you can do is you have your fragment and you could sequence it from both ends. So while the sequence is larger, 400 bases, you have the first 150 bases from one end and the other 150 bases from the other end together. And now when you read, when you align read one and read two onto the SM, onto the reference genome here, what you see is that they're separated by 700 bases. Here, they were separated by 400 bases in your uh, original genome that you have taken from. So which means that this indicates that there is a there is an insertion in the reference genome that you do not have. And this could possibly be a repeat insertion, let's say, and I will repeat again, right? So this is uh, when you do a paired and uh, read sequencing, you could also identify uh, some structural variations in your genome, right? Including your repeat insertion polymorphisms or small insertions or deletions. So that is also one idea in sequencing. You could do single end sequencing or you could do a paired end sequencing. And these may, again, be helpful in assembly. Now we come to assembly complications when you have repeat end. So for example, here, the red one is a repeat end, right? So what you do is you have your repeats, uh, you have your sequences here. These are individual reads, A, B, C, D, and E. So you have, when you compare the three prime end of A, you have a unique overlap with three, five prime end of C. So you know, C follows A. Now when you compare the three prime end of C, it has the same match with the five prime end of B, with the five prime end of E, with the five prime end of F. So now you are stuck. You're not sure which of these fragments is next to C. So this is uh, one major problem with short reads where you cannot really uh, very comfortably do a de novo sequencing. And therefore, most of the times when you have a short read, you do a reference-based assembly. With long read sequences, there is an advantage that you, because you have long reads, some of these reads would span over the repeat end and have a unique end. That would allow you to assemble them de novo without the need of a reference, right? So that is, uh, again, some something that is advantageous with long read sequences. So here we are, we are talking of these. So we are talking of Sanger sequencer. Then this is the Illumina, the original version, right? Then you have the ion torrent machine. Then you have nanopore. And you can see the size comparison. Nanopore is mostly of size of a large pen drive, right? And it could be held in hand. And that is the the plus uh, or, or advantage with nanopore. We'll talk of it in more details as we go along. Then you have the promethan. This is the multiple assembly of nanopores. And then this is your pack biosequencer. So this is the evolution of sequencing techniques you're talking about. In between, there have been many other techniques that have come and gone. For example, pyro sequencing is obsolete now. Likewise, solid sequencer is obsolete now. So there has been evolution in the last 20 years. We have moved from first generation to second generation to the third generation of sequencing. But sequencing began with Fred Sanger, right? And Fred Sanger got Nobel Prize twice. One was for uh, for identifying the insulin sequence, and the second was for developing a technique for uh, for the DNA sequence. So Sanger sequencing, as you popularly know, and the other person here is Walter Gilbert, who also developed a method of uh, sequencing the DNA, which was not so successful because it could not be automated. So this is here. So even today, most of the sequencing techniques rely on polymerase. So what happens is you have a template that you want to sequence here. You add an adapter to it so that you, you can add a complementary primer here. And once you add the complementary primer, you give DNA polymerase. And DNA polymerase, as it extends the nucleotides, you are able to, in some manner, identify which nucleotide got added. And that allows you to basically decipher the sequence on the template because of the base complementarity rule. Right. So here you are. This is how you do it. So basically, the most of the techniques uh, rely on polymerase-based sequencing. You have a primer of DNA of length n. So this is the red fragment is represented as DNA of length n. You give a DNTP and you give DNA, poly DNA polymerase. The primer gets extended by one nucleotide at a time. And it also releases a pyrophosphate and an H plus ion. And these are important because 
In some cases, you identify by which nucleotide got added. In other cases, you identify by whether the pyrophosphate got released or not, especially in uh, pyrosequencing, this was the case. And in other cases like iron torrent, you identify the signal of incorporation based on whether the pH of the medium changed or not, because there will be iron ion release if the incorporation of the nucleotide takes place. So therefore, each of these has its own importance, but most commonly what you use is a fluorescent uh, DNTP, which is differentially colored, which means A, T, G, and C are all differently colored, and that allows for uh, basically, you know, identification of which nucleotide got incorporated in real time. So we come to first the Sanger sequencing, very quickly we'll go through this. So Sanger sequencing was a very smart way of sequencing the DNA. Uh, they used DNTPs and alongside they also used what is known as DDNTP or dideoxynucleotide triphosphate. So these would not have a three prime OH. And because the three prime OH is absent, then once the DDNTP gets incorporated, further extension does not happen. So here you are, you have your primer and you're extending. So you, the, the polymerase will have a choice of adding a normal thymine or a dideoxythymine. If a dideoxythymine gets added, no further extension happens. However, in cases where you have a normal thymine, it moves to the second position. Again, it has an option of adding a dideoxyadenine or a normal adenine. If a dideoxyadenine gets added, you will not get further extension. So likewise, you keep doing on these positions. And what you end up is, if you see here, what you end up with is a series of fragments that differ from each other by one nucleotide, and they have a color tag, tag at the last nucleotide that is there. And because each of these four nucleotides have a different color, you are able to identify what is the last nucleotide in this particular fragment. So what you do next is you separate them out on a gel, and the gel that we use here is capillary electrophoresis. And then, of course, you also observe what is the nucleotide passing through at the point of observation. Uh, based on the color, you have a laser that detects which nuclear, which, what is the color here, and that allows you to translate it into a uh, language of uh, nucleotides. And that is how you get a final sequence. So this is your sequence here. And if you see what you get is a chromatogram and which corresponds to bands, and these can then be you know translated into actual nucleotide. So automated Sanger sequencing was a smart move because it used differentially labeled fluorescent DDNTPs, facilitates resolution of all fragments in a single lane instead of four for each sample. So before using uh, differentially labeled uh, DDNTPs, the only label available was uh, what is known as a radio label, and radio label would produce black color. So therefore, for one sample, you had to do four different reactions. With DDNT, differentially labeled DNTPs, DDNTPs, it became easy. Uh, for one uh, sample, you had only one lane, and that became easy. Differential labeling also increases the read length as the bands can be allowed to flow out of the gel post detection. So in this case, you could not allow the gel to uh, the bands to flow out of the gel. Here in this case, you have a detection point here. Once the, the band has been detected and the color is known, you know which nucleotide it corresponds to. You can allow it to pass through and allow the other bands to get resolved, right? Then you use capillary electrophoresis and higher parallelism of 96 sample samples in one run, and the sequence are put in the form of a chromatogram. So this is typically a chromatogram that you see here. And you had automated Sanger sequencer, and uh, automated Sanger sequencers were, uh, while they were, you know, uh, uh, very effective in sequencing the human genome. So the major achievements of the Sanger sequencing, in 1995, we were able to, say, to, to sequence the first free living organism, that is Haemophilus influenzae. In 1996, we sequenced yeast. In 2000, we sequenced Drosophila and Arabidopsis. These are both model organisms, I'm sure you know. Drosophila is for animals, this is for plants. And then in 2001, the crowning glory of Sanger sequencing was that we could sequence the human genome. However, the problem was that it had taken us 10 years to sequence the human genome, also because there was no reference available earlier. And then, of course, uh, what was more important was that uh, besides 10 years, it had taken us. 3.2 billion dollars to sequence the first human genome, which was a problem. If uh, if a genome was to be sequenced at 3.2 billion dollars, we are not anywhere close to our um, idea of personalized medicine, right? So therefore, there was a grand challenge that was launched, and that resulted in the second generation of sequencing techniques and uh, uh, developed to sequence and assemble the whole genome using a reference. Speed and cost effective was what was important. The idea was to develop a sequencing technique that would sequence the human genome around thousand dollars, right? And very recently, we have come very close to sequencing the genome in thousand dollars. So, based on these 
techniques and uh, the, the evolution of sequencing techniques, you now have three generations of sequencers. One is the classical, the first generation. We've talked of uh, Sanger method. Then you had parasequencing, virtual terminator sequencing, and solid. Both parasequencing and solid are now obsolete, but this one here by Illumina, virtual terminator sequencing, is the market leader even today, right? And then, of course, you move on to the third generation. This is 2008 and evolving. And you have nano five, nano four, and torrent and single molecule real time sequencing, which are now leading the market. Illumina, of course, is the one that leads the market today. Eighty percent of the market is by Illumina, but uh, the long range sequencers are fast catching up with it. So here you are. If you look at the comparisons, the effect, uh, the effort has been into increasing the read length. And uh, if you see here again, uh, the pyro sequencing was a polymerase based sequencing. Solexa was polymerase based sequencing as well. This is Illumina. And solid was like HB sequencing. Now these are obsolete. Uh, Illumina is what continues. So if you look at the contemporary sequencing technologies that are available in the market today, you, you can classify them into two different uh, categories. One is what is known as the short read sequencers, and the other is what is known as the long read sequencers. And as the name indicates, short read sequencers will have short read length, and therefore the assembly would be a bit of a problem. Long read sequencers will have longer read length. The assembly will not be a problem, but there could be problems in the actual accuracy. So what people now do is to go for long read sequencers to ensure that they correct the correct they get the correct assembly and basically couple it with short read sequencers so that the individual positions if they want to look at variations, those are basically correctly identified by short read. So you have a hybrid uh, you know methodology or uh, or basically synergize long read with short read to get correct assembly and also the precision in terms of the individual variation points that you're looking at. You follow class, everyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good. So then we move on and we talk a bit about common features of second generation sequencing. So here you are, library preparation, random fragmentation, starting DNA, addition of custom linkers. This is common to all of the second generation, whether it is parasequencing or Illumina, or solid, then you have the library amplification. So the individual fragments that you generate, they have to be amplified in a local, very closed area that is basically called a cluster. And uh, there are two types of PCR that you do here. One is called the bridge PCR and the other is called the emulsion PCR. Bridge PCR works for Illumina and the emulsion PCR works for parasequencing for solid and for ion torrent, right? And then, uh, Next, uh, what is important is that all of these techniques give you a direct detection as the nucleotide gets incorporated, you have an idea of which nucleotide got incorporated. So this is real-time sequencing. And uh, the other important feature is um, where it is scores over Sanger sequencing is what is known as the massively parallel sequencing. So these are high throughput techniques. You have millions to billions of reads coming out from one run of the machine. So therefore, uh, the, you know, the short read is compensated by the actual output that is very huge. In contrast to capillary sequencer, that is the Sanger sequencing, the read lengths are shorter here, right? So uh, I have already told you, Illumina will give you 150 bases, and your uh, ion torrent will give you around 100 bases, right? And power sequencing could give you around 400 bases, but now it is decommissioned, not, for, not in use anymore. So first we talk of Illumina or the basic sequencing reaction that takes place in Illumina and Illumina has a whole range of, so this is basically your revolution where you have, you know, depending on what is your requirement, you have various types of Illumina sequencers uh, giving you a certain range of high throughput depending on what is your individual requirement, right? So this is also democratized the sequencing revolution. Earlier sequencing used to be only restricted to a few centers and you have to send your samples. Now, individual labs can have sequencers of their choice based on the requirements. So this is basically also democratization of the sequencing reactions that uh, were initially not possible. So that's the revolution. So here you are. What Illumina uses is a technique very similar to Sanger sequencing, except that in Sanger, the termination was permanent. In Illumina, the termination is only uh, Temporary. So what they use is, uh, prior, uh, is proprietary nucleotides that have a virtual terminator moiety and a fluorescent molecule attached to it. As long as the virtual terminator moiety is attached, no further extension happens. That gives you time to identify which nucleotide got incorporated. Once you have identified the signal, you cut off this virtual terminator moiety, and now it is ready for the incorporation of the next nucleotide. And I'll show you in animation how this happens in the next slide. So the virtual terminator uh, nucleotides are nucleotide analogs, contain a fluorescent dye and a chemically cle cleavable group called 
virtual terminator group or virtual terminator moiety. Once incorporated, the virtual terminator unlocks block further incorporation until the virtual terminator moiety is chemically removed. Therefore, they're called virtual or reversible terminators because the termination that happen, happens is reversible in contrast to standard. The virtual terminator label is removed before the next cycle and you could do it by chemical treatment. So here you are. So here is your flow cell. I'm showing you only two templates. Actually, these are multiple copies of the same template, millions of copies of the same template in this location. Likewise, another template here and millions of copies of this here, which are generated by bridge PCR. And now you start your sequencing reaction. You give all four nucleotides together based on the base complementarity rule. Individual nucleotides will go and anneal. And because they are differentially labeled, they would give you a color. And this color is what you're, you're detecting as your signal, right? So here you have a thymine incorporation. Thymine is blue, so you know on the template there will be an adenine. Likewise, here there is an adenine incorporation. Adenine you have tagged as red, so now you know that on the template there is a thymine. And this is your virtual terminator moiety. So before moving on to the next cycle, you need to remove your virtual terminator moiety. Once you remove that, now you move on to the next cycle. Again, you have the incorporation based on base complementarity rule. And then again, you have the a terminator moiety, so therefore no further extension happens. You can read what is the fluorescence coming at this position in the flow cell, what is the fluorescence coming at this position in the flow cell. That allows you to identify the nucleotide incorporated, and then again you can remove this and move on to the next cycle. So this is how it happens, this is how it works. So we are looking at two positions here, uh, position one and position two, and we're looking at some six cycles here, right? So if you see here, when you look at this the first time, you get the green signals for both, which means the cytosine got incorporated. Then the second time, you have a adenine incorporated in one, and you have a cytosine incorporated again in the second one. And you can keep doing your cycles, and then you keep observing the colors that are, uh, that are obtained at individual positions, and that finally gives you the sequence. For example, here, uh, the second sequence, Every time it is a green that is getting incorporated, which means every time cytosine gets incorporated, which means on the template, it would be a guanine, right? And for the top one, you have for every cycle, a different color getting uh, showing up, which means a different nucleotide gets incorporated. So finally, you have a sequence of CAT, CPGT, right? So this is how you take your cycles. And if you see the actual file of uh, past few file of filament sequence, you'll see this term cycle. Cycles means how many nucleotides have been incorporated, right? So as many cycles you grow, as many cycles will be, nucleotides would be incorporated. Next, we come to the next generation sequencing techniques, the third generation. Here, there is no imaging. And because there is no imaging, these are faster and much cheaper as compared to the second generation. And here we have uh, one that is ion torrent. And this is an ion torrent machine here. And if you look at the basic idea of ion torrent, I showed you in the incorporation of a nucleotide via DNA polymerase, as the nucleotide gets incorporated, you have the release of a hydrogen ion. So instead of checking for fluorescence, this machine checks for whether there has been a decrease in the pH uh, upon incorporation of one type of nucleotide, right? So what you do here is instead of giving all four nucleotides together, you give only one type of nucleotide in one cycle and look at positions where there is a decrease in pH. So that is the whole idea behind ion torrent. So here you are, the flow cell is flushed with single nucleotides at a time. The semiconductor chip records pH changes upon incorporation of complementary nucleotide by polymerase. So this is important that you give only one type of nucleotide at a time. You know what you're giving. So therefore, if you're giving adenine and you see at certain positions there was a decrease in pH, you know that there was a thymine on the template there, right? The change in pH is proportional to the number of nucleotides added. And current lead, read length is around 100 basis. There has been some improvement to this, but uh, not beyond, let's say, 150 basis for now. Now we come to the new range of sequences that have come up, and these are the long range sequences, and one of the primary ones here is what is known as nanopore. And the advantage of nanopore is, is it is small in size, so it can be used as a point of care machine, a point of care device for a country like India, where the hospital setup is not very expansive, and uh, patient has to go to the hospital and, and, and get checked. Uh, these devices can help the individuals go to the patient instead of patient coming to the doctor. So basically, these can serve as what is known as the point of care device, right? And that is the advantage with nanopore uh, devices here. So what is a nanopore? A nanopore is essentially a nano scale hole. The hole may be biological, solid state, or hybrid. 
And uh, the idea, and here is an example of a biological nanopore. This is alpha hemolysin protein. It is a heptameric protein. And you can see the stru 3D structure here. This is the tunnel. This is actually the nanopore. And this is the side view. This is the front view. This is the tunnel through which, you know, you can pass your DNA if you wish to. So the idea behind nanopore sequencing is very simple. The nanopore is placed into an electric field. And because it is in an electric field, a basal current passes through the nanopore. Now, when you introduce obstructions to the nanopore or you allow certain molecules to pass through the nanopore, based on the shape, size, and charge of the molecule, you will have characteristic fluctuations in current. And for us, luckily, uh, what you have is depending on uh, both ad adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine produce different fluctuations in current. So that fluctuation in current is characteristic of the nucleotide that is passing through. That allows you to translate into uh, translate it into a sequence, right? And what is also important here is that even a methylated cytosine will produce a different fluctuation as compared to a non-methylated cytosine. So therefore, here you can also study the epigenetic state of your uh, genome uh, without going through a very complicated process of bisulfide sequencing, which is done in Illumina process, right? So this is uh, where the advantage is. One, you get long reads. Second, you can also you read uh, get a read uh, read out of your epigenetic state of the genome uh, without any special treatment of the DNA, right? So when a single molecule passes through the nanopore, characteristic disruptions occur in the current flow based on the structural features and charge of the molecule. So this is what you do. You basically use a helicase. So this is the technique where we are not using DNA polymerase. So remember this. So in nanopore, you're not synthesizing a complementary strand and reading the nucleotides as they get incorporated. What you simply do is unwind a piece of DNA and force it through a nanopore, which is placed in an electric field. Based on the fluctuation in current as the nucleotide passes through the sensitive position, you will have the, uh, the sequence translated into ATGC, right? So this is uh, what is uh, nanopore, Oxford nanopore, marketed by Oxford nanopore. Time to sequence human genome would be around, you know, uh, roughly one hour or something, uh, 15 to 20 minutes are, if it is absolutely perfect. A size of the sequencer is a pen drive, and this is scalable. You could have multiple nanopores put together into an assembly. Cost of sequencing the human genome would be around uh, $1,000 here, right? So nanopore advantages, direct RNA, DNA sequencing, real-time, ultra-long reads. I've already told you these are long read sequencers, and you could get ultra-long means around 50 KB of read length. Direct methylation call, uh, you don't have to go through a bisulfide process for sequencing, scalable to, uh, to portable to or, or desktop. And then of course, a uh, point of care dry device, uh, you could have a, you, know, you have a very small average preparation of 10 minutes and the high fidelity. Uh, this is basically the advantages that you have. The other one that we have is what is known as SMRT, single molecule real-time sequencing. This is still relying on DNA polymerase. Uh, and But what is important here is that it's only taking a single molecule for sequencing. So what are PCR artifacts that, that may happen during your Illumina processing or, or for that matter, ion torrent, which also uses PCR? Uh, these are ruled away, right? These are these are outright ruled. Now, there are two challenges to a single molecule real-time sequencing. One is the signal intensity. So because you have only one molecule and you're incorporating a fluorescent DNTP, the signal intensity will be very low. And how do you compensate for that? Because that could also be an artifact or, or a complication. So what, for that, what you do is very a simple idea. Uh, let's say you have a 40 watt bulb and you are placing it in your drawing room, which is the largest, into your kitchen and into your bathroom, which is the smallest. So you know the signal will be, the, the intensity of light will be the largest in your bathroom because the area that it is covering is very small. So likewise, what uh, SMRT does is to basically immobilize a piece of DNA polymerase and your DNA in a very small volume, which is known as zero, vo uh, zero wave guide, right? And we'll talk of it as we go along. So what you have is zero mode wave guides. So these are very small spaces in which a single DNA polymerase is incorporated and it is, uh, and it is then uh, basically it's provided with the DNA template that you want to sequence. So therefore, the signal is still, the intensity of signal is still good enough to detect because the volume of the space where you're doing the reaction is very small. Then the second important problem is polymerase fidelity. So you know that polymerase is not perfect. So while you're sequencing, it may add a, a, a non complementary nucleotide as well. So if you have a single real-time single molecule, then once a in, uh, misincorporation happens, you would have this idea that, you know, this, this cannot be corrected. 
So what they do here is they circularize the template that you want to sequence. So this is the sequence the template that you want to sequence. You circularize it by adding adapters at both ends. And then you sequence it multiple times like a rolling circle model. So the polymerase keeps sequencing it multiple times. <clears throat> so what happens is you will have the entire sequence and in between you'll have your adapters. Then you align your sequence that you get. So this is kind of a concatenator that you get and you align it together. And for each position, you look at the most frequent nucleotide that is there. And that is what is known as a high fi read. You generate a consensus sequence depending on what is the nucleotide most commonly occurring. That is your greater than 99% accuracy now. So you have overcome the two basic problems that are there with single multiple sequencing. One was the signal intensity by creating zero, wave, zero mode waveguides. And second, you are looking at, you know, circularizing your DNA and sequencing it multiple times. So if, if at all there is a problem with respect to the fidelity of polymerase, you're still looking at a consensus sequence. So the nucleotide that appears most commonly at a given position is what is your final sequence. So this kind of gives you high accuracy. So this, these are known as the high fire rates. So this is your system here. And then of course, this is a comparison of read length. So you get on an average half the data in reads of greater than 30 KB. Some of the reads, 50 top 5% reads are greater than 50 KB and so on and so forth. So therefore, you know, these are long read lengths and that allows you to basically assemble the genome uh, more correctly and a de novo assembly of genomes is possible. Now we come to data analysis part, and uh, of course, data analysis can take a full course of six months. So what I'll try to do is to give you a basic idea here again, not going into too many details, but to give you the basic steps in data analysis. First, of course, is the data quality control and modification. So you first, uh, the data that comes as the raw reads in the form of past Q files, and then you have to check whether your past Q files, the quality is right or not. So normally there are certain programs that are available. For example, you can do a fast QC, which is the most common method of doing quality control. Fast QC will generate a lot of graphs that will tell you whether your reads are good quality or not. So it will give you a, you know, the read quality at each position. Then it will also give you the GC content and so on and so forth. And it will also show you what a good graph would be like. So you can have your corrections. Based on that, you could do certain modifications. The most common modification is the removal of adapter sequences, which may be a contamination. The other thing is many a times as a machine artifact, the five prime end and the three prime end sequences are not so exact. So those five or 10 base pairs can be taken away and that allows you for a neat, good quality data from there on. Then once you've done this, the next step is to map the uh, map the, uh, the sequence to most commonly to a reference, right? Or in case you're doing a uh, uh, you know, de novo assembly, then also you are basically mapping them against each other to find unique overlaps. Uh, and you could align them to a reference. Most commonly, if it is Illumina, you'd be doing a alignment to reference. If it is long reads, you could do a de novo assembly. So you one versus a, all versus all comparisons and looking for unique overlaps. And then beyond this point, you, depending on what is the objective of the experiment, the pipeline may be different. If you're doing uh, variation analysis, you'll look for variant calling so you'll follow the vcf pathway if you are doing your transcriptome so you would want to you know first identify exon intron boundaries assemble your full transcript together and then quantify how much of each, each gene is present if you want to if you're looking at uh, you know dna protein interaction so you would have your small fragments of dna to which your protein had bound and you would look for again quantify how much of each type of sequence is present if you're looking for epigenetic states again you will quantify for each region, how much of the cytosine of a given, you know, for each position, how much of a given number of cytosines are methylated or not. If you're looking at chromatin uh, states, again, you'll use a tax set. Uh, so these are the five major uh, sequencing uh, uh, applications that are the follow up of the initial sequencing that you give uh, DNA sec, RNA sec, chip sec, BS sec, and tax sec. And there are the, several other. Uh, slighter modifications, but these are the main main ones, main type of analysis that you do. And because uh, the sequencing data is high throughput, a manual analysis is not possible. So therefore, uh, you know, the importance is of, you know, using the programs that are available. And because programs can read only when the data is present in a specific manner or format. So therefore, NGS data analysis involves a lot of formats, right, to begin with. We'll discuss a few formats here. The most common format is basically your sequence format. So you have the fastq format, which is the standard format for representing sequence data here. 
So four line format for sequencing data includes quality scores. Um, that is why it is called fast queue because it also contains quality scores. I'll give you more details of this as we move along. Alignment files, SAM and BAM format. Uh, we will not talk of much details of this. And then you have annotation, which is GFF3 and DTF format. And then you have intervals format or the bed format. Uh, some of this we will not be able to discuss today for lack of time, but of course uh, we can go ahead and see how much we can cover, right? And the lecture will extend a little, maybe 10 or 15 minutes extra. We'll see. So here you are. This is your fast queue format. Uh, fast queue format is the standard sequence format that you have in NGS, in NGS data. Now, if you look at this, this is one sequence that is represented by four lines. The first is the identifier line. This is a unique identifier for each sequence. So if there are 10,000 sequences in your file, each one will have a unique uh, identifier in the first line. This begins with the at the rate sign, followed by some encoding that gives it the uniqueness. Then the second line is the sequence line, the actual nucleotides identified at each position. Then the third line is, uh, begins with the plus sign, and sometimes it would be just having the plus sign, nothing else. And at other cases, it would have the identifier again, uh, following up the plus sign. The fourth line is the quality scores line. This is basically to uh, to basically, you know, indicate what is the quality of the individual nucleotide that you're calling at each position. And this is a sky encoded, so you do not see the actual numerical values, but it can be translated into numerical values later on. For example, here, this uh, uh, rectangular bracket, uh, the, the second one, basically represents uh, a spread quality of 29. So what is spread quality? We'll talk of that as we move along. So FRED is a program that assigns quality scores to each nucleotide call in a sequence. FRED scores are logarithmically related to probability of error. So Q is the FRED score. It is basically minus 10 log of the P, right? So a FRED score of zero means the probability of uh, error is one, right? So this is your zero, a probability of error is one. A FRED score of 10 means the probability of error is 0 0.1. So this is the probability of error P, right? A FRED score of 20 is probability of 0 0.01 error. A FRED score of 40 is probability of 0 0.001. So usually we have a range of 0 to 40 for FRED quality scores. Anything above 20, 20 is acceptable. Anything below 20 is not so acceptable, right? So this is uh, what is in, in brief about the FRED scores. So the first thing that you do once you get your data is what is known as the quality control. And the most common uh, algorithm that we use for quality control is the fast QC and fast QC the top uh, the first graph that you get in fast QC is this so here you are this is the quality scores across all bases Sanger Illuminari this is basically what you see here the quality score for the first position second position third position fifth position and then uh, beyond a certain point it just the beginning so for position 15 to 19 the cumulative quality score is now being shown here right and this is the range this is typically what is known as box plot box and whisker plot you have uh, indications of the 25th and 75th percentile and also the 10th and 90th percentile. The green region is where it is acceptable. So anything above 28 to 40 is absolutely fine. Uh, in fact, anything above 20 is also okay. Uh, if, if you have most of it in 40, a few in 28 is fine. But then if you have anything below between zero to 20, then there is a problem. If there is a major part of the sequence here, then you'll have to, you know, trim to that part unless your scores come up in this range. So after the fast QC report, you do the trimming so as to ensure that what you give, what you give as data to the next steps in the process are absolutely confident data. Right? Then the next step here, once you have done your trimming and everything, is what is known as the alignment. And there are several types of aligners that are available. You have uh, short read aligners and long read aligners. So uh, you have shorted aligners like Bowtie 2, burroughs willer algorithm aligner, hey, high stat 2, Mummer 4, star is for RNA alignment, top hat 2 is also for RNA alignment, fly is for long read sequencer DNA alignment. So you, depending on what is the type of data that you want and what is the type of platform that you used, you will have to select which type of aligner you're going to use. Mostly all of them will give you uh, nearly accurate results, right? Then the alignment format is also there. This is uh, 11 column string and you have several inputs here. So as to ensure that you have, you know, you can go back and check how good the quality of alignment has been, right? Then we come to the revolution and uh, we talk of milestones in sequencing. So uh, if you see uh, 
last to last year, nature came up with the special issue, February 2021. This is nature milestone for genome sequencing because this was 20 years of the sequencing of the human genome, and you have the listings here. This is very short, so let me just give you a more uh, compact, a more readable view. So 1977, the first uh, virus was sequenced. 1982, better for lambda was sequenced. Haemophilus influenzae, the first living organism, sequenced in 1995. You can see there is a whole lot of gap until 2001. And since 2001, we have started sequencing extensively, and we have sequenced literally everything that we know is mostly sequenced now. Or, or sequencing today is not a challenge at all. That is the basic uh, revolution that we have today, right? While the first human genome was sequenced in 10 years at $3.2 billion, we are today talking of uh, sequencing a human genome at $100 and roughly half a day or let's say, you know, less than half a day. So that is where our idea of precision medicine takes wings. To have precision medicine as a general practice in medicine, the first thing that you require is that everybody needs to get sequenced. So therefore, you know, that's the revolution that we're living in today. And uh, of course, for everything today, even for the coronavirus, you know, that the confirmatory sequence uh, test was actually sequencing and you had some narrow ports installed at airports when at the peak of the corona uh, phase, right? So I'm sure you know that. Class, you're following everyone? Yes, so. Okay, so I see the attendance has been uh, stable. Nobody has left, so which is good and encouraging. I was expecting more attendance though. That is one thing that uh, that is a bit disappointing, but it is okay. So here you are, and we have come to a point where, where we can sequence a uh, a genome 10 times larger than the human genome. So for example, here the axolotl genome and, uh, has been sequenced, which so is 10 times larger than the human genome, right? So now sequencing is no more, uh, sequencing genome is no more of a challenge. The challenge is analyzing the data that comes after that, because the data that comes is huge. And uh, unless you have certain, uh, you know, programming skills, it will not be possible to analyze that data. So here you are, uh, broad applications, variant calling, you could do a DNA sec and you could identify variants uh, in an in individual genome and look for how these variations impact his wellness. Then you could do an epigenomic study, methylation status, cytosines in CAG, CAG, and CHH context in plants. So this is called bisulfide sequencing. And I've already told you if you're using Illumina, you'll have to do a bisulfide sequencing. If you're using Nanopore or PacBio, then in that case, and long range sequencers, the readout for epigenetic state is also automatic. You don't have to go through a special process. Then you have, when I was in Paris, I was doing this BSEC data analysis uh, roughly two years ago, just before the onset of, uh, of the pandemic. In fact, I came to India after there was a lockdown in France. Then you have the transcriptome analysis, RNA-seq data analysis, and then finally you have the protein uh, binding to DNA, and that analysis is known as a ChIP-seq analysis. I've already also told you about ATAC-seq analysis that informs you about the chromatin state of the DNA, right? Key features of NGS that make it so important, one is the scalability. It is massively parallel sequencing, high throughput parallel processing of thousands of samples. Speed, it is quick. Whole genome in half a day now. Exome in a day. A, what is exome? Exome is only the express, pa express part of the genome. So we'll come to it, what is an exome and why it is important. Then this is high resolution. I've already told you this is deep sequencing, high coverage, 100 to 150x, uh, very, uh, very routinely possible and single base pair resolution. And then, of course, uh, because uh, you use uh, in second generation, you use uh, uh, small reads. So, mostly what you do is a reference based assembly. Right? Coming to exome sequencing, so I told you even today, uh, a $1,000 genome sequencing is not possible. Uh, it is almost achievable now, but not, not so much. So, uh, while it is still uh, exorbitantly constant, so uh, uh, I mean, it is it is very expensive. So what people do alternatively is to go for what is known as exome sequencing. So you know that, you know, uh, only 1.5% approximately of the genome is actually coding for genes. And 85% of the mutations that impact gene expression are within these genetic regions. So what you do is you are still getting 85% of your disease information by just sequencing 1.5% of the genome. So therefore, the cost of sequencing goes dramatically down here and you're still able to get almost 85% of your disease causing information. So therefore, uh, this is one process that is preferred. Exome sequencing as of today is very commonly done, right? And uh, so for exome sequencing, you need to capture from your fragmented library, you need to capture only the DNA that corresponds to genes. So therefore you have special methods of doing that. We're not going to details for lack of time, but I'm sure you'll be able to go through them. 
Then some of the Mendelian disease genes from exome or genome sequencing data that have been identified uh, using second generation sequencing. This is the list given here. Then, of course, uh, you can do a targeted panel, gene sequencing panel. So instead of let's say you already know that these are the significant uh, mutations or important mutants for a, for a specific disease, so you could create a panel of only these mutations and do a direct sequencing of only those uh, parts and get data on how, you know, uh, how, uh, how uh, what is the probability of your patient or or your subject getting that disease, right? So this is what is known as targeted gene sequencing panels, focused panels contain a select set of genes or gene regions that have known or suspected association with the disease or phenotype under study. Gene panels can be purchased with pre-selected content or custom designed to include genomic regions of interest. Multiple genes can be assessed across many samples in parallel, saving time and reducing the cost associated with running uh, multiple separate assays. And what you also get here is a smaller and more manageable data and more, uh, more directed data instead of whole genome, where you get a lot of data, but you're not sure of what you're going to do with that data. So this one here, uh, based on the knowledge base, you could specifically target to specific known needs. So this is more like a candidate gene approach for identifying whether the individual is susceptible to a certain or what is the what is the probability of his being susceptible to a certain disease. Then uh, I'm sure you would know about metagenomics. So metagenomics is basically studying bacterial populations as a whole. So earlier, the conventional method, if you look at, you took onwarded sample. Let's say I wanted to know what is the composition of my bacterial population in the pond water sample. So I take the pond water sample, I culture it out first. This is a mixed culture from here. I create pure cultures and then characterize the bacteria. The problem here is that the moment I go for culturing, I am losing out 99% of my diversity straight away because laboratory conditions and the media that I use may not allow me to actually grow all the organisms that are present in this particular pond water sample. The alternate here is metagenomics, where this is basically an NGS-based sequencing technique, where you directly extract the entire DNA in sample, do a whole genome sequencing or a partial genome sequencing in the sense that you could only do a 16S uh, for prokaryotes or 18S for fungus and other microorganisms, and then do a molecular characterization. You match the database, identify which type of organisms are present in your metagenomic sample. So this basically gives you a very, uh, you know, a uh, very detailed idea of what could be the possible uh, components, uh, what could be the possible species present, and uh, how much of it is, you know, uh, uh, I mean, also it gives you an idea of some community structure that is there. So we'll not go into the details for now, but uh, I'm sure you'll be able to see. So you could do a 16S RDNA metagenomic sequencing, or you could do a whole genome sequencing. If you do whole genome sequencing, you would be able to identify the bacteria until the strain level or the substrain level. If you do the 16S RDNA sequencing, you would be identify you would be able to identify the bacterial population until the genus level and very comprehensively. So this is basic idea of metagenomics. There are a whole lot of metagenomics projects that are going on. You have the human microbiome project. So one idea of uh, the wellness here is that also the the bacterial population that is present in your elementary canal could also decide how well and how physically fit you are. And there is also this idea of, you know, microbiome, microbiome implantation. So people are trying to identify what is the composition of a microbiome in a healthy individual versus a diseased individual. And whether a replacement of this, uh, you know, uh, the healthy microbiome can lead to rescue of the phenotype or, or, or basically the, you know, the wellness of the individual. So these are some of the projects that are going on. You can have a look. There is also a project called Earth Microbiome Project where you're trying to catalog every single microbial species present on the earth and from, uh, you know, from all possible uh, niches. Then we've already, already talked of largest genome ever sequence. This is axolotl. And this also gives us to the, gets us to the idea of uh, C-value paradox, right? C-value paradox, I'm sure you would have read. It means basically the idea is to you know, uh, the C-value paradox essentially says that, you know, the genome size does not have any correlation with the complexity of the organism. So these are axolotl salamanders, uh, axolotl larvae. Um, these are, uh, these have DNA 10 times larger than the human genome. Right? So this is one review you can go through. Uh, and that is where I mm, picked up the title from. Also, I added my part from evolution to revolution. And that makes it very cheesy and, and, and very, uh, you know, Striking. So DNA sequencing at 40, past, present, and future is one review that you, you may refer to. I'm also writing one review on DNA sequencing techniques 
that would come up in the next few months. You can also have a, re a reference here. Then as I referred, we are now only in 2022 April that we have been able to sequence the human genome absolutely completely from one uh, from position one to position last on the chromosome. So telomere to telomere assembly, this is called. And this was done by, in 2019, Karen Mega and Adam Philippi, organized telomere to telomere assembly consortium to fill the missing pieces in the human genome. And when you did this, what is the extra amount of sequence you got? You added nearly 200 million base pairs of novel DNA sequence, including 99 genes likely to code for proteins, which are not known till date, and nearly 2,000 candidate genes that need further uh, study for and for the curation to, to basically identify whether they're actually genes or not. It also corrects thousands of structural errors in the current reference sequence, the GRCS38 reference assembly. So this is as late as April to 2022. And those who want to get, get into research must keep reading papers, right? That is important again. This is uh, the, the assembly here. This is called TT2CHM13 version 2.0 on NCBI. You can have a look at this, right? And then, of course, uh, maybe for lack of time, I will skip this part, except that I'll give you an idea of what this means. So basic idea is if you look at the, you know, if you look at the conventional method of giving the medicine, the idea is that uh, irrespective of whatever the genotype individual has, you give the same amount of medicine to everyone. One dose in the morning, one dose in the afternoon, one dose in the evening. Now, based on the mutations that the person carries, uh, the same amount of dose may be effective in some individuals and maybe actually toxic to other individuals. So therefore, uh, in personalized medicine, one idea is also is to look at the genome and based on the variation that the individual is carrying, you need to modulate the dosage that is given to the individual, right? And here is the reference. You can go back and look at the reference of this paper. And this is the reference here. And uh, for lack of time, I'm not covering this for now, but you can always go back and check. What lies ahead? We are moving into the era of pan genome. So this would be basically now that multiple individuals have sequenced in multiple countries and there is a whole lot of sequence information available, the reference human genome will be replaced by what is known as the pan genome. Pan genome would be a combination of multiple sequences put together and multiple vari variation information put together and also the impact of those variations in this local subpopulation. So that is where we are heading and that should basically be the beginning point now for our next uh, series of uh, precision medicine and other experiments. The desired skill set. So now that you, we have come to the last, uh, let me just give you the desired skill set. NGS data type is typically big data and requires computational data analytics skills. You need to know one programming language. Python is preferred now because Python is the base now. And you should also have uh, good statistical knowledge. So you must be, uh, you should know R. R is free, MATLAB is paid. Biostatistics is because you have a uh, huge data. You use statistics as every step to, to show that what you're taking forward is actually good quality. Then you could use some command line, you know, some scripting like awk, uh, some tools, Picard, some tools, bed tools, Bismarck, et cetera. You could also be familiar with Galaxy, which is an online uh, integrated development environment for end user data analysis. And then familiarity with the Linux environment would help. So this is where we end. If you want to go into some more details uh, on my YouTube channel, you could go to my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel has the same name, Dr. Vipin's Biotech and Bioinformatics Classroom. And there is a whole lot of, uh, you know, uh, talks there. You can have a look. So for example, here, there are more than six playlists now. You have a playlist on recombinant DNA technology, and there is a playlist on R. There is a playlist on tools and techniques in biotechnology, introductory bioinformatics, and so on and so forth. And go go home and have a look. Uh, I'm sure you would find it useful. There is also a, a a playlist on Python. So I'm also teaching Python. We have begun with uh, simple steps. And today, uh, I think by tonight, I will be 20,000 uh, views by tonight. So the channel is doing well. And uh, you can have a look, right? So on that note, I'll close. The channel has the same name, Dr. Vipin's Biotech and Bioinformatics Classroom, right? So you can go have uh, explore the channel. If you like, you can like, you can subscribe, you can share, recommend your friends, and so on and so forth, right? So we stop here. I see some chat messages. So let me see. Uh, thank you so much, sir, right? Marvelous to everyone. Okay. And then, sir, don't you think there would be any error in human genome project during the third assembly stage as it has been? Yes, absolutely. So that is why we're moving to the pan-genome stage. And I've already told you that uh, 
with the telomere to telomere assembly, we have you know identified certain errors, structural errors more so, and that have been corrected. So, Kruti, I think uh, that is the answer to your question. Uh, okay, so there's only one question. Anybody else who wants to ask a question, you have another two minutes for that, right? Uh, else we'll close the session. Any other question, class? So, uh, yeah. first of all, I would like to thank you, sir, so much for such an enriching talk. I also got to learn so much about NGS today, and I had heard about um, a few things, but you know, you explained it in such a great manner. Thank you so much, sir. And yeah, about yeah. participation also, I would like to say that, you know, sometimes the time zone becomes an issue because I had some participants join at around 6.50. But then they had to uh -huh. go because the session was late. But we have people that ask us for the recording. And we also share it over our YouTube, um, where we have like around 12K um, subscribers. Uh -huh. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. thank you so much, sir. And I had a few I questions. I have a few questions here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sir, I also had a few uh, questions that came up to me in the personal uh, message. You can uh, firstly uh -huh. go through Marvelous question, and then I can um, like quickly okay. go through. Uh -huh. So Marvelous asks, what are the prerequisites to get into metagenomics for someone with no background in comics? So uh, the prerequisite uh, to get into metagenomics would be, you know, to uh, first understand the basic concepts of genomics, right? Uh, also understand what is the 16S RNA and how is it used as a marker and how you can use the full genome sequencing. And plus also, you know, uh, a programming background would help. So as I said, prerequisites would include uh, a, a bit of knowledge of Python, a bit of knowledge of R, and if that is not possible, then definitely you have to be conversant with Galaxy or Taverna, which are the workflow pipelines for non-programmers. Uh, but it is always good to know programming. That would that would be basically this. Uh, no problem, Nokia, no problem. So maybe if it is recorded, you can have the... Uh, thank you, Kruti. Thank you so much, right? Thank <laughs> so you so much. I would like to ask you... Um... Two yeah. questions quickly, uh, which yeah. was sent to me. So one of it was that DNA sequencing has transformed the field of forensic science. In your perspective, right. have we reached the maximum potential of this technology or where do you see the future of DNA sequencing headed in forensic science? Oh, well, so uh, as you know, in forensic science, uh, up till now, the basic uh, gold standard was DNA fingerprinting, right? So you looked at specific regions, in the VNTRs and other regions where you could develop a fingerprint and that could basically help you implicate, you know, who is the perpetrator of the crime or let's say a species identification. So you could do a P450 amplification, identify up to the species level. Let's say you have confiscated some bones and you want to know if this bone is coming from human or from, you know, animal. So, which is uh, the most common type of cases that you generally get. So that would, could be done. And now, of course, uh, everything is going through this sequencing. So I already told you that the in the in the initial part that there is a new thing now that uh, sequence is the new microscope. So once you sequence something, you are absolutely sure that there, there is no iota of uh, of doubt about you know that uh, what is the uh, what is the belonging of the sequence uh, to. I, I mean. Well, which species or which individual does it belong to? Uh, there is very little doubt in that. So I think that will be the ultimate of uh, DNA uh, in forensics is to do DNA sequencing and then uh, unambiguously identify whatever your sample is or whatever your case is. So I guess yes, we are very good. And the plummeting cost of sequencing. So initially, the why uh, we used to go for southern hybridization or those kind of tests or PCR amplification tests was because those were cheaper than sequencing. Now that the sequencing cost is coming down and it is uh, absolute unambiguous, uh, you know, uh, explanation. And even when you did PCR amplification for DNA fingerprinting, at the end of it, as a confirmation, you also did sequencing. So therefore now uh, sequencing could be a straight away first answer, right? So that is, uh, I, I would suggest that, you know, everything is now boiling down to sequencing. And the cost that has come down, I'm sure you know of the law where, you know, it is said that the cost of, uh, transistors would come down to half and, and the capacity would go by double and uh, Moore's law that is. Sequencing costs have beaten Moore's law by, by miles. So therefore it becomes very important. And how can you assist someone who wants to build up skills in bioinformatics? Well, assisting someone in building bioinformatics, you can check my uh, YouTube blogs there. And there is one that is talking about introduction to bioinformatics, one thing. So basic bioinformatics is web-based bioinformatics that we do. Uh, some of the basic analysis you can do web-based. 
then also i have a, a channel on i have a, a playlist on r programming and i have a playlist on python programming which is mostly for bioinformaticians uh, with some basic uh, data analysis so you could go there and check that i hope that will be helpful and then in case you have some individual questions you can always come back to me and ask me right i'm available 24 7 so no time zone issues here right so you can always come back my email is given you can check my email and get back to me at any point of time right yeah. recently i had given a talk in africa that was with uh, one group there and i had a few attendants there right you're most welcome eric mavanti right and everybody else so kruti uh, that if you have any internship opportunities in your working field uh, not in our university as of now but uh, we'll see if, if it is available it will be advertised i'm very active on social media on linkedin other things are you she knows right so yes sir. so if there is uh, <laughs> so uh, okay so i'll give you the mail here it is the pin dot thing dot c u and g mail right and you could go to uh, Google and type Vipin's e classroom, right? You could type Vipin's e classroom, it will take you to my website. You will have my information there as well. V I P I N Vipin's E C L A S S. It will take you to my website. Also, it will give you the idea of where my YouTube channel is. And um, just type on Google, and the first it would be my website. You can just check that. So, mm -hmm. any other questions? Yes, sir. Just the last one. Uh, are there okay. any freely available NGS analysis tools or softwares? Yes, yes. Everything is freely available. NGS analysis is very democratized, right? So the tools are freely available. So like FastQC, just type on Google and you'll be able to download it, right? And it is it is a Linux-based, uh, unless you're doing web-based, uh, you will have to be into a Linux environment. Everything is freely available. There is nothing that is, you know, uh, uh, paid. Um, for more and, and even if there are some paid softwares, there is always a counterpart uh, uh, where which is free level. For example, again, like R and MATLAB. So MATLAB can also help you do a statistical analysis like R, but MATLAB is paid, but R as a as a framework is freely available, right? And then everything is available also on Galaxy. And not one tool, there are multiple tools that are available. You all you need to do is to explore a bit. And you'd be able to, you know, find a tool that suits your requirement. For example, if I, if you remember, I showed you Bowtie, I showed you Red Hat, I showed you Top Hat, not Red Hat, Top Hat. I showed you Fly. So these are all aligners that are available freely. So most of the data analytics that you do with NGS is freely available. Should not be a problem with that. All right. Thank you so much, sir, once again for joining with us today and for such such an enriching talk. It was really great to have you. And oh, is, uh, yes, also sir. send me the uh, send me the recording, huh? Yes, sir. I'll surely send you the recording. Thank and so we will also like uh, for the participants because when we shared about your session, I had so many emails and messages regarding it. Huh. So we will be sharing it with them also if they'll be asking about the session in case they've missed it. And yeah, they no will... problem. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome, Ash.